Welcome to Think Tech, Think Tech Talks here on a given Tuesday in the one to two block. We have on the phone, rather on Skype from Molokai, uh, George Benda, who's a Molokai resident, uh, a leader of Chelsea Group there, and an energy consultant uh, who knows a lot about energy in general and also a lot about energy in Molokai. And the reason we wanted to talk to him was because of a, a, an article in the Molokai Dispatch, the headline for which was, a uh, $3.1 million battery proposed for the power plant in Molokai. Welcome to the show, George. Nice to have you. Thank you, Jay. A pleasure to be back. Uh, you know, I wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm so curious about, you know, how, how this is all settling out. Molokai, uh, you know, doesn't like wind much, like Lanai. Molokai has, uh, you know, old diesels, I guess, uh, running its power plant on a fossil fuel basis, uh, like Lanai. And now this, this thing pops up with a fairly high-tech uh, $3 million battery, a two megawatt battery that's supposed to be installed this summer in Molokai uh, to enhance uh, the stability of the grid on Molokai. That sounds pretty, and HNEI, Hawaii uh, Natural Energy Institute is involved way deep and all of a sudden we have high tech coming to Molokai. So what do you think, George? I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly excited about this, Jay. Uh, this is something, uh, and, and I, won't, I won't claim any credit for the, the eventuality of it, but uh, I had a discussion with uh, Governor Abercrombie about a year and a half ago uh, when the wind issue was, was hot and said, look, Molokai is your best bet at, at demonstrating uh, micro smart grid, a small community uh, grid in, in which you beef up the infrastructure, particularly with energy storage. You put the batteries in, there are other ways of storing energy as well, uh, but uh, batteries are really simple and straightforward and, and comprehensible and measurable and, and their performance is great. Uh, you uh, put those batteries in and you stabilize the grid and then you just keep pushing the envelope on renewable energy inputs. Uh, eventually, Molokai can be uh, self-supporting without fossil fuels, uh, given, given its location, its population, uh, the amount of roof space, the amount of open space available. Uh, but it takes energy storage to do that. Presently, we store it in the form of diesel fuel. And batteries are much better than diesel. Yeah. Well, so uh, that that sounds like it was a watershed conversation with Neil Abercrombie. But uh, ultimately, Miko, that is Hiko, uh, you know, made the decision to do this and to uh, spend three million dollars on it. And to uh, I guess they got some of that money, one point eight million, uh, from Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and they in turn got it from ONR because this is kind of an experiment. Um, and and the rest of it is is on the uh, ratepayers of Maui County, um, and I guess Miko, uh, you know, is the operative force here. They made the decision. They're following through. They're actually making it happen. Um, did you have any watershed conversations with them too? No, I did with Hiko uh, on uh, in uh, in Honolulu. Um, Again, I, I'm not taking any credit for any of this, Jay. I, I think that that uh, you know this stuff is is widely in the in the ambient buzz about what needs to be done as an energy solution. Uh, it's 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 a widespread feeling that this is the right direction to go, and and I think we're all uh, happy to see it heading here. But the micro smart grids have been a personal campaign of mine. I believe that uh, they are the ultimate solution um, to Hawaii's energy problem, and perhaps in many parts of, of, uh, of our country and, and around the world. So, uh, you know, with HECO, we had many conversations about wind um, with, their, with their planning group. Uh, I, was, uh, I was party to, to many of those. I instigated many of those. And, and my sense is that, that uh, some of the planners listened, and this is exactly the kind of reaction you would expect, which is a relatively small trial project Two megawatts in the scheme of Hawaii's energy is really tiny. Uh, Three million dollars. You have to remember, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, but uh, the price tag on wind was three billion dollars. Uh, so you're looking at, at three orders of magnitude difference, and this is uh, something that can be installed in uh, in a short period of time and be operational in the summer. Uh, it's a it's a world of difference, and it will it will enable. Uh, participation in, in self-generation by a, a much larger 
component of the Molokai community, which has been stalled because of the uh, uh, grid interconnect issues. Um, I, I, for instance, did not install solar in my home. Uh, at the time, I was debating wind, solar, and so forth on a small scale for my home. Uh, missed the window and it, it, it closed. Um, I would have to do a self-supporting installation. I'd have to have my own micro smart grid for my own home, in essence, to, uh, to make that installation work. What's a micro smart grid as opposed to a smart grid? Uh, it's a it's a smart grid, but it's on a small scale. So what you're typically doing is looking at a li limited number of users, uh, a, a much more um, anticipatable load, a much more uh, uh, narrow planning kind of thing. Um, so as you as you look at the scale of a grid, the grids right now are the scale of um, Honolulu of, of, of Oahu. The entire island is really a grid. The entire island of Molokai is a grid. And this first effort on Molokai will address the entire Molokai grid, but it's such a tiny element. We have uh, fewer than 7,000 people living on the island. Uh, the, uh, you know, we, we only have a few megawatts of, of, of uh, generating capacity. And so we are, we are a, a, a micro situation, if you will. Uh, it would be a, a, a small part of a small neighborhood in, in on Oahu to do a similar project. Yeah, well, just looking at Molokai for a minute and trying to, you know, get the landscape uh, right now, and I guess these are old, you know, if not ancient, there are three two megawatt diesel generators operating and six one megawatt generators operating, uh, you know, for a, a total, I guess, of, uh, let's see, that's six plus six. 12 megawatts for the island. Do you have any idea what the peak load is in Molokai? Well, again, I'll, I'll go on, on newspaper and, and reports and, and what I've heard from, from people at Miko that we're, we're in the range of, of uh, five megawatts of, of peak power. Um, and uh, the, the newspaper says it's uh, uh, 5.4 megawatts. So that's that's been a consistent number for a long time. We don't we don't really change in our load very much here because we don't have much growth and we don't have um, industrial operations really that that would uh, draw down power on an irregular basis. Yeah, and and so um, uh, Maui County has the highest uh, you know rate of uh, installation of uh, photovoltaic in the state. Um, I guess that makes it an enlightened county. On the other hand, uh, my, my question is, uh, you know, how about Molokai? Is Molokai having, um, you know, a high rate of installation of photovoltaic? Uh, and, and I've heard it, I told you before we started the show, I've heard it from both sides. Some people say that, uh, oh yes, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's like Maui County in general. And, and some people say, no, it's less because people on Molokai cannot afford the, the photovoltaic installation. Uh, what, what's your experience with that? Uh, my take on the situation is that the, the numbers reported seem accurate to me uh, based on what I observe on the ground. About 20% of our power is, is generated by, by solar. Of course, that's only uh, uh, daylight sunshine hours, so uh, you, have, you have that issue. But about 20% uh, is, is solar. Uh, meaning about 80% of the capacity is still sitting out there uh, yet to be tapped. I think the, uh, you know, the, the use of solar is perhaps uh, disproportionate um, based on that, that wealth issue. Um, but uh, by the same token, you know, a lot of the, the merchants were the early, the, the early adapters here. So the downtown stores uh, have solar on their roofs. Um, the, uh, the residential applications have been pretty widespread and you know, a lot of it's out in um, in the homestead, so I, I, I have a hard time swallowing those who, who say it's not happening because the people are too poor. One of the things that does happen here is that with uh, there there are several people who have been selling uh, the uh, uh, power purchase agreement style, and I know several of our neighbors have have taken up the power purchase uh, agreement you style. You mean feed-in feed tariff? No, no, quite the reverse. This is uh, the the solar developer comes in and says, okay, I'll put solar on your house. Uh, it will be net metered. And with the net metering, uh, I will, uh, uh, you will pay us uh, a certain amount per kilowatt hour that's generated by the, the solar collectors. So you're, you're, you're discounting what you would have purchased 
from Miko because it's net metered and you are paying instead typically in the range of 15 to 20 cents, sometimes 21 cents per kilowatt hour to the solar developer for putting those uh, uh, devices on your uh, on your roof typically. And then, you know, that's your, your net savings. The uh, All the capital cost is borne by the developer. Yeah. It's not so, borne by the homeowner. So it's essentially a financing arrangement to uh, you know, put the photovoltaic on your roof. And I expect that when um, on, on bill financing comes around, which is supposed to be in January, keep your fingers crossed, George, um, you know, that, that will help um, Molokai a lot because then even if you can't afford it, uh, you know, in cash, uh, you can have a, a modest uh, amount on your on your electric bill, and ultimately you can finance uh, PV that way. It leaves, you know, it takes the last barrier away, uh, the last barrier short of an interconnect uh, barrier, um, so financially for people to get PV on their roofs. Um, those those are very uh, accurate statements, Jay. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of of the residential uh, on bill uh, financing approach that's that's been passed and. Uh, I intend to take advantage of it after the first of the year, and, and um, you know I'll be the first in line uh, here on Molokai to, to do that. Uh, I think it's a very exciting opportunity, and, and I, uh, one of the provisions you didn't mention is that the law expri- explicitly states that the condition of financing is that your utility bill not exceed what it would have been, and I assume that's with, with various adjustments for weather and so on, mm-hmm. uh, without the, the solar PV, so it, it really... It really creates an opportunity for any utility bill uh, uh, account holder to uh, install the, the the solar PV uh, effectively uh, on their on their place. You know, George, uh, you're knowledgeable about this. Uh, I keep uh, seeing data, hearing data, uh, and in fact, we're having a uh, show about this later this week with uh, Marco Mangelsdorf uh, of Hilo. He's an installer there very knowledgeable also about uh, the PV industry. And uh, the figures seem to suggest that this year uh, is going to be way less than last year in terms of installations and revenue earned by uh, photovoltaic uh, contractors. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, you know, here we are, the, almost the end of the year. I don't know if that's going to be the case on Molokai, but that seems to be the case around the state. And I wonder if you have any ideas about why that's happening why are PV installations declining so so dramatically? Is the word uh, in the PV industry in Hawaii? Well, it, you know, it's a complex set of factors that's coming into play, Jay. And I, there's a there are a series of, of market penetration uh, models that that will apply. And so you saw the early adapters, uh, you know, ten years ago, were putting solar on. Uh, with the federal tax breaks, uh, huge interest came in, and uh, the addition of state tax breaks uh, typically set most of the most of the paybacks of, of two years or two to three years for solar installations. Uh, that's gone wild. Then prices started dropping on the panels, and all of that stuff contributed to an accelerated market penetration. Excuse me. But now you're running up against. Um, uh, these grid interconnect issues, you're running up against uh, now the, uh, the the easy roofs are gone where it's a single owner with a, a perspective of a long-term hold of their home and their or their business. Uh, and now you get into uh, the, the commercial market and other places where it's much tougher to sell these uh, these concepts and, and, and approaches. Um, we still haven't gotten, uh, all of the models that we need uh, from a, a regulatory perspective to make this happen. The on-bill financing helps enormously, but there are still still these underlying technical issues. And then you just have the resistance of folks who don't want something complex in their life, even if it saves them a little money. <laughs> it's true. We're going to take a short break. Uh, it's George Benda, uh, who is a Molokai resident, who joins us by Skype today for Think Tech Talks. He's an energy consultant uh, with and a leader of the Chelsea Group uh, in Molokai. Uh, we're talking today about uh, about new storage uh, coming to Molokai. We'll be right back after this break. We want to thank our underwriters. 
Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, this state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Welcome back to Think Tech Talks here on a given Tuesday in the one to two block. I'm Jay Fidel here with George Benda, who joins us by Skype from Molokai. He's a Molokai resident and the leader of Chelsea Group. He's an energy consultant, and we are talking today about the storage, the new storage that's coming to Molokai. So, George, uh, one of the things I'd like to talk with you about is the situation in Molokai. Um, it appears, uh, at least from this article in the Molokai Dispatch, about the battery that's proposed for the power plant in Molokai, um, that uh, Molokai has a problem with st the stability of its grid. It has brownouts. How long has that been happening, and how serious is it? Well, you know, first of all, uh, any small island grid is going to have a, a, a range of difficulties. Um, and it has to do with a combination of things, aging infrastructure, the nature of the generation, systems, their reliability. Uh, so when when we moved here, uh, when we were first uh, looking at, at, at building our, our house, we were, uh, we were renting a house. And uh, how long ago was that, George? That was uh, over a dozen years ago. Okay. And uh, we had uh, we had blackouts. We had uh, a number of power outages that would would last long enough that all of the all of the frozen food in the in the freezer was was destroyed. That's serious. So, yeah, 12, 16, 20 hours. And so we designed into our house a battery backup system for our offices and our refrigeration. So what we're working on now, if the power went out, you would you would not notice it. I would not notice it. It just the battery kicks in and it's and it's done. Just as a digression, what can you describe that system so we know? I mean, for example, Joe Saturni and Island Pacific Energy uh, has developed and is marketing uh, something it calls M Power, um, which is something close to I think what you're describing, where you have you know it's your own battery, and it backs up your system in your house and right. keeps things going for days. Right, and what we have here is a is a is a pretty straightforward installation. We use an an, an inverter. Uh, that will become part of our, our solar system as well. Uh, the inverter takes uh, power from, from MECO and uh, stores it in the batteries. And then when the MECO power shuts down, the inverter cuts off the feed back to MECO so that we're not powering back into the grid and making it dangerous for workmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it supplies the battery-based uh, power to our, the circuits that we've, we've got on it. And what we've got on it are our offices, so that our telephones and computers and, and lights work in our offices, and uh, and our refrigeration, uh, so we never lose our freezer. Um, we can go. We designed it. If everything was running full bore, they would they would work for uh, 36 hours. But the fact is, we conserve energy whenever there's an outage, and and we we've. we've uh, We've calculated out based on the the, uh, the battery use that's somewhere between uh, 60 and 72 hours of uh, of backup. So we're we're in good stead. If if the power goes out, we still have have some uh, uh, some opportunity. I have to tell you, the funny part is though that my my wife, who's a, a an addict to TV, absolutely <laughs> loves television. She she runs an extension cord from the. Uh, offices over to our television so that she can watch TV and then the neighbors are all calling over here saying uh, you have power how, how, how's that working how can you be watching TV 
<laughs> it pays to be Akamai about energy, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it's you know, the little tricks that count. <laughs> and some of our neighbors use generators for those purposes, but but we all have. We we probably have had in the in in the more than a dozen years I'm I've, we've been here. We probably have, have averaged about one short outage a week, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, outages up to twelve and eighteen hours. We've never reproduced that twenty plus hour. Uh, outage that we had uh, when we first moved here, but the uh, Miko is investing in the infrastructure. They've been uh, they've been putting back uh, new cable, replacing the the rat torn cables that are out here on the west end. And I think the west end probably is worse than other parts of the island in that it's the uh, older, longer runs of infrastructure that so has is, more is that damage. What it is? When you have older, longer runs of infrastructure in the grid. Uh, then you're more likely to have uh, brownouts like that. Is that what it is, or is it? Uh, are there other blackouts. factors also working? Well, the blackouts are largely from the old infrastructure. The brownouts are a different story. Um, brownouts come from two two directions. One is if there's a user on the line that can uh, vary its demand and it increases its demand rapidly. Uh, you would see this in if it wasn't all planned for and built in. If someone turned on one of the big air conditioners for one of the buildings downtown in a, in a small grid like ours, it would suck down so much power that the grid would go into a brownout. Uh, and it wouldn't particularly get enough power either, uh, depending on how it was placed relative to the generation. That, that's one side of it. The other side of the equation is something happens on the generation side. And what happens here uh, is this whole transition of, of of um, small generators and so if the if there's one two megawatt generator uh, cranking along and it's doing okay but now the now it's getting farther into the day and we have more demand and it starts cranking up and we need a second two megawatt generator there will be an unevenness as the power comes comes up from that uh, and then when it goes back down, it can you can be slightly off and, and dip down below it. It's uh, something that that uh, advanced controls can can master a little bit, but it's still a problem. The bigger problem comes from uh, the 20% presence of solar, which means if the generators are operating under the assumption you're going to get 20% of solar, and then a big cloud comes over, kind of unknown to the the operators, and blocks out half of that suddenly they can be down to one generator or down to two generators when they need three or whatever the equation is but one generator short and all of a sudden there isn't enough electricity for everybody on the island the voltage dips and then things go into various stages of uh, of mess mm -hmm. yeah which 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 burns refrigerators right you can lose your refrigerator or other appliances or devices when you have serious yeah. instability that way and we have very typically have very short life on appliances here for for that reason, um, and and so that that all of that plays in. You know, they end, it ends up with a lot of ancillary costs. Uh, for example, I play in a in a in a in a musical band, and we uh, we what play every song. What instrument do you play? I need to know this. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I play guitar. Um, yeah. But I recently broke my finger, so all I do is sing. So I, okay. my, my left hand, see, I've got this, I've got this wound on my left hand now. So, um, thank you for but, that. Uh, yes, I thought you'd like, not like me to share that. Uh, I play guitar, and and the band, uh, uh, you know, we have a, an elaborate sound system with a, a digital, uh, a digital board, digital recording board that we use. It's very, very sensitive to to power. So we've put monitors on the power, and so every Sunday afternoon we have a very good idea what happens. And typically, every Sunday afternoon, um, in the in the transition between midday sun and afternoon sun, and uh, who knows what else is going on at the plant, uh, we see a, a voltage dip from um, the the 120 to to 110, 109, 103, um, and our system will go crazy if we didn't have battery backup uh, that we we bring to every performance to to uh, protect the board. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to back up one minute, uh, no pun intended on that, uh, and ask you, you know, assuming, you know, just ex excluding photovoltaic for a moment and just talking about these, uh, what, uh, there was uh, eight, eight separate diesel generators powering uh, Molokai. I mean, they're, and they're, I'm sure they're conventional, you know, they're old. Um, is there a way that you could smooth out the curve with uh, smart grid devices uh, on old equipment like that? Or is it that 
and I really don't know the answer. Is it that with old equipment, even new devices won't help that much? And that if you want to make a smart grid, forgetting about storage for a minute, but a smart grid is smart as you can get without storage, uh, you really need to have newer uh, generating equipment. Am I right about this? Because it has to respond quickly, and old equipment doesn't respond that quickly. Am I right? Um, yes and no. Uh, the, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of a complicated anecdote. Uh, the company I had before this one, we owned some cogeneration plants, and one of those plants was my nightmare. It was a uh, 1940s diesel engine-based cogeneration plant in a uh, hospital in Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, you know the drawing the loop around and give you an idea of the consequence of this, the, the plant lost $100,000 a month because it had so many outages. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, that's what happens as equipment gets old. Uh, you, the, the equipment that was designed was designed for constant speed, constant operation, continuous operation. So an old diesel generator that's expected to just keep cranking at basically the same speed all the time, it's called base loading, uh, those things will run pretty much indefinitely. You'll probably have to repair the the uh, the generator as opposed to the engine. The engine turns a crank, and the and the the crank makes the uh, generator go around, and the generator makes electricity. That generator and its bearings will wear out, but the, the the diesel engine, properly maintained, will just keep cranking along next to forever. And you see that all around the world. You'll find operations on Pacific Island, Pacific Islands where the, the diesel generator went in in the 30s or 40s and it's still just doing great. So those things are all, uh, you know, those are all really uh, important things to keep in mind. However, uh, contemporary equipment, uh, you're, you're looking at equipment that folks have focused on turning up, turning down, making variable, that will be more easily controlled and it would resolve some of the problems the, the question is how fast can anything respond? And uh, turn down in any power production is, is not instantaneous. That's why the batteries, or as they say in this article, this load banking concept where you use essentially giant loads of capacitors to absorb and then re-release re uh, the, uh, the power uh, on, a, on a relatively instantaneous basis as opposed to a long-term battery storage basis. All of those things are necessary simply because no equipment can respond quickly enough to a cloud coming over or uh, many of the other things that happen with uh, with electrical uh, uh, dis distributed electrical generation using solar and wind. Well, it sounds like uh, you know things that things um, were manageable, uh, although not great, until solar happened, and now solar happens and it takes twenty percent of the you know total load. Uh, and solar is a is a problem because the wind, rather the um, you know the sun comes and goes, and it's not it's not firm at all. And so then you have greater demands made on an, on an aging system, and um, and of course the load bank is not enough to really make a difference. And I, what I want to ask you after we come back from this break is is how the people in Molokai, you know, who have been very passionate about about wind and the undersea cable, how they have felt and what their reactions have been uh, to the brownouts and the instabilities. We'll take a one minute break here, George. That's uh, uh, George Bender, Molokai resident who joins us by Skype from Molokai. Uh, he's the leader of the Chelsea Group, which is an energy consulting firm. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Here we are on Think Tech Talks. Welcome back uh, for the Tuesday 1 to 2 block. We're here with George Benda, who joins us from Molokai. He's a Molokai resident, joins us uh, with Skype. He's an energy consultant with the Chelsea Group, an energy organization in Molokai and elsewhere. 
Uh, and we're talking about uh, the new storage system that's going to be installed in Molokai this summer by the Maui Electric Company, part of HECO. Uh, and very interested to see, you know, how, wh why and how that affects things. Uh, so, George, you know, the people in, um, in Molokai have been, you know, very passionate about wind. They have opposed wind, especially wind that serves other islands. They have opposed the undersea cable to Molokai. And they, for that matter, they, under, they oppose the undersea cable insofar as it affects Lanai as well. Um, now, how, how do they feel about the brownouts? How do they feel about the instabilities of the existing, what is it, uh, eight uh, generator system? Twelve there. generators. Yeah. Twelve, Twelve generators. generators, yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, uh, the, the the folks who uh, comprise uh, Ialoha Molokai, the folks who really put together this uh, this effort, um, uh, are, are very much um, engaged in finding solutions to these kinds of problems. They're not uh, naive about the challenges of solar. In fact, a couple of uh, a couple of the folks that are, are involved are in fact uh, contractors who provide solar uh, installations on the island. They know how the the utility interconnect works. They know the problems of uh, sunshine hours and and disrupted service. So they understand all that. That's none of that is is news to them. What they've been hoping they can avoid is the kind of installation that I did on my home. They'd, they're hoping that doesn't have to be battery backup house by house to accomplish this. And so uh, I'm quite certain that they're all cheering for this battery installation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what you have is a, a, a relatively ancient and creaky electrical system taking in new technology. And uh, like any of the, the, the grids around the country, uh, all of which are aging terribly and in very bad condition. Uh, this upgrade is not going to be uh, entirely seamless and it's not going to be cheap. Uh, it's going to take time and money to make this happen. What's hopeful here is that it's going in the right direction. And I, I, I have to believe that the activists from Ialoha Molokai are, uh, are fully engaged in, in helping this happen. I know there was a public meeting regarding the battery, and, and I know that they were uh, present in, in great numbers and, and seemed to be very supportive of, of the battery efforts, um, and, and with good reason. You know, the, 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 the cable, the purpose of the cable is to enlarge the grid to make all of Hawaii a single grid, or at least all but Kauai part of that. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, that's the kind of utility thinking that was in place a hundred years ago, and to extent it's it's good and necessary uh, in some ways because that means that you have uh, generating capacity throughout the islands can be shared uh, as it is for the most part on the mainland. But what you also pay is the price that that uh, happened on the mainland with some of the catastrophic blackouts that we've seen over the last 20 years where the entire Northeast would go down because the the, the, uh, the massive grid had a, a trip in a relatively small and isolated location that caused a cascade failure. So, uh, uh, you know, the smarter the grid, the better, the more localized the grid, the better from my perspective. And well, I want to the, touch that, I want to touch that because you have, you have really been talking about, you know, the great dichotomy, the great tension in this development how, as it unfolds in Hawaii. That is, should we have, uh, you know, uh, distributed energy in a smaller area or should we look for larger areas? I mean, for example, in the Joe Saturnia uh, storage model or in your storage model, it, uh, the homeowner puts it in. He spends the money. He has greater independence. There are a lot of people who would like to go and who, in fact, are going and have gone uh, completely bare. Uh, you know, without any connection to the grid, and they want to have the equipment necessary um, to do that. Uh, they they want to be completely distributed to themselves. And on the other hand, there are people who feel that the whole state ought to be unified, and that you have to have large installations, you know, to to support the entire society. And we can't have everybody going off by himself. Uh, this is a really interesting, if not philosophical, ethical, societal question. And you've touched on your feelings about it, but I wonder if you could expand on that. In this case, uh, where you or others in Molokai could solve the problem with your own individual uh, storage system, uh, you're supporting a, an island-wide storage system. Do you think that is the way to the future? 
I, I think the, the wave of the future is going to be a, a, a distributed storage system, uh, Jay. Um, and, and, and I've been saying this for a number of years, the, the, the model that we need to think about is really a neighborhood-based model. Uh, I, I agree with those who want to see society-wide, and I don't think that we ever want to be in a position where we don't create uh, the interconnection of a series of, of smart micro-smart grids uh, to provide a backbone. How large does that need to reach? Well, it needs to reach large enough to protect the the uh, the largest element of the of that uh, uh, demand base. So you have to look at um, uh, grid planning in a in a different way going forward than you're looking at it today. Uh, the the notion that just big is better that that a couple of giant plants and and uh, some big heavy cables is going to solve it. I think that that's that that concept has been well discredited over the last uh, thirty or forty years, as those systems have deteriorated and and the problems have increased. Of course, we couldn't have built the United States as it is, the industrial base of the United States, without that kind of commitment. Uh, but then you have to remember the scale of the things that we're talking about. Uh, the, the, the industrial base and so forth that supported those enormous uh, investments of plants. We don't have those in Hawaii. And so when you look at what we have in Hawaii, we have this tremendous distributed resource in terms of solar energy. We have a distributed and largely residential population, a relatively small industrial base. And so the, the notion of a, a large uh, power generation source feeding to uh, a large grid doesn't really make sense uh, on that model, but we can we can certainly link all of those grids so that we have um, a backup in various forms to to support it. I think that's the way the future should look. How close it comes to that is a series of political and economic decisions, uh, corporate decisions uh, that uh, you know we 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 don't none, none of us control, and so. All we can do is point in a direction and say we really think it should go that way. Well, and and perhaps it's also um, it's also developments in technology. Uh, you know, as with all other technology, you you can't anticipate disruptive technology that is going to change everything, and make uh, all your planning irrelevant somehow, and make you go on another course in order to uh, keep up with what you know then appears to be the best practice. So I guess my question to you is, smart grid. You know, I, in the course of these energy shows, I ask everybody what they think the smart grid is. Because sometimes I think, well, you know, when you get past the word smart grid, what is it exactly? And not, 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 not everybody has a good answer for that. Uh, what is your answer in terms of the technology? What is a smart grid and how close are we to, to having a smart grid? Yeah, uh, there's always intelligence embodied in, in, in a grid and there are central control rooms in, in the grids. What a smart grid implies to me is that there's feedback between the end users and the power generation uh, beyond the change in their demand. So you can see in real time the, uh, the, the, the changes that are happening before they impact the distribution system. So if I, if I turn on a, a large air conditioner, uh, that signals to the grid that this large air conditioner is going to turn on and the response can be made at the power plant before the power plant sees that in the pipeline. So I like to equate electrical distribution systems to plumbing distribution systems and, and um, almost everybody's experienced the toilet flush while you're showering uh, syndrome. And you know basically the same thing happens in grids. Well this is like someone saying, hey I'm going to flush this toilet so that you can either adjust the shower or step away from it while it's there. Well, smart grid gives the opportunity for a power plant operator to adjust a, a large number of things. How far so along smart... the trail are we? I mean, can I get a catalog in smart grid equipment and um, you know, and, and mail order black boxes that will do all these uh, you know sort of uh, uh, inter 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 discussion things? You know, these these engagements uh, of one part with the other. Uh, can I buy Gee, that equipment I, now, or is it still, is it still uh, theoretical? I, I don't know, Jay, but you just gave me a great idea of a, idea of a little black box that I could sell to people thinking that they were putting a smart grid in their home. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, here, here's where it stands. The, the federal government has been supporting a demonstration of smart grids for um, more than a decade. 
and uh, actually considerably more than that. And so in some locales around the country, these smart grid technology has been well proven. Uh, there are examples, uh, San Diego uh, uh, State University, I believe it is, has a tremendous uh, micro smart grid where they, they interact with the utility and manage their own energy sources and so forth. And that one has a great YouTube uh, video about it. So the examples, the equipment, it's out there. It's, this is not exotic equipment that somehow, you know, Buck Rogers in the future or Star Trek in the future. Uh, this is stuff that's here today, but it's also something that has to be designed, integrated. The whole issue in the smart grid is it, it's an integrated system. And so it's going to take a lot of effort to uh, make that integration work. If so you have to have around, somebody who comes along and evaluates the grid. Let's say it's clever. <laughs> uh, uh, from a clever grid to a smart grid, um, you know that's that's an enormous number of steps for the utility to take, and it tends to look like a huge, huge cliff that they have to climb. And uh, with the micro smart grid, you you nibble away at that, and you you have a path up that cliff. Well, that, that takes us to the last and most important part of this discussion, for which we have seven minutes, uh, namely, uh, you know, uh, the the usefulness of this whole uh, exercise here this summer with the three million dollar storage battery in Molokai. Now it's being done with uh, ONR money, at least in part. Um, it's, it's 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 everyone knows this is going to be an experiment since, uh, as I understand it, the um, the title to the battery will stay first with the battery manufacturer, uh, Atair, I think is the name of the company, uh, and then it will go to, it will transfer to HNEI, which is installing it, I guess, um, and then it will go to Maui Electric. And in the process, HNEI is going to be gathering information for a number of years to do calculations on the effect of the battery on smoothing the curve and avoiding blackouts and so forth and improving the uh, what do you call it the micro the microgrid in Molokai uh, this to me is the the driving point of my interest in in what's happening in Molokai that is we are going to learn how a small grid works we're going to learn how the battery the in, you know the uh, installation of this battery affects everything about it, and we can use those lessons in other more complicated, larger grids. Um, are people talking about that? Are you thinking about that, George? Well, I'm certainly thinking about it. I have not heard anyone talk about it, and I I don't think it's a wide topic of discussion. I think that uh, most of the island here just feels a sense of relief that someone's thought far enough ahead. To come up with a solution to the the battle with Miko over how many solar collectors they can put on their house, and I think that's how most people think of it. How does it impact me personally? How does this uh, you know how does this look for for my utility bill? Uh, but uh, I, I agree with you entirely, Jay. Uh, you know I, I was very excited when I saw this uh, as a development, uh, as a first step towards doing this all over the state, and and creating these smaller smaller blocks uh, this scale this uh, this two megawatt battery is a is a great scale to be working at for community level because you can average enough across it to uh, to make it happen the problem with a, a single homeowner going solo is that you know sort of one bad little thing happens one bad little day and the whole system is a, is a disaster uh, I know many people who do live uh, off the grid um, it makes their lives complicated. It takes a, a significant percentage of their time, you know, sort of a measurable percentage of their time to manage their power. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I happen to think that, that that's not a good use of, of your time. Uh, I really just want stuff to work. And uh, that's what this, this opportunity looks like. And once we have the data from the battery, once we know how it behaves in, a, in a, it, what amounts to a relatively random uh, uh, microgrid. Uh, we should know a great deal about how far we can push the solar envelope, how far we can push storage, um, how far we can we can push alternate generation of, of different kinds. Yeah, you know, we, we, we're sort of stuck in this whole interconnect question and how much can you put on without frying the existing system. 
Um, and you know, it's been political, and it's been it's been a big argument. And uh, the solar industry is smarting over the limitations that have been posed, imposed by the utility. Uh, and it's, you know, in some ways, we really don't know what the boundaries are. We can't afford to go too close to them because, you know, we don't we don't want to fry the system. Um, on the other hand, uh, I mean, we have all a lot of reasons to to try to solve this problem and find out exactly where the boundaries are. And, and maybe, you know, this battery will show us where the boundaries are in some kind of uh, algorithm, some, some way of looking at it that we can apply elsewhere. And I just wonder, if you were, if you were looking at this, if you were looking at the data that was coming off this, uh, this whole new installation, what would you be looking for to apply in, in other islands in another circumstance in order to solve the interconnect problem? Um, I, I would be looking at the uh, degree of intelligence in in the in the application that's here, and what aspects of additional intelligence could make it even more effective. Uh, of course, I'd be looking for the overall performance of the system. Uh, the, the you know the keeping the, the the sixty cycle hum working through the system, but the the bigger question is for the application what are the limits what what are the opportunities if we for example had a a, a small uh, photo sensor on on every uh, solar array that that told us immediately when it was going to stop producing uh before we saw the effects on the grid would uh, would that improve the performance of the battery or is it simply useless information those kinds of things would be very important to me Yes. Well, it sounds like you know, just putting that together and integrating all this, is that the this 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 new battery and the uh, you know the installation of this battery in the Molokai system, uh, such as it is, um, will will suggest to us other smart grid equipment, other sensors, you know, other analytical devices, other act you know activate activation devices. Uh, right. that we don't really know about yet, that we'll be able to figure out uh, once we see the battery uh, in operation. And so this could be a big threshold right here in Molokai. Molokai may be making a huge contribution to clean energy for the state, don't you think? <laughs> I, I, I believe that. I believe that. Um, and and as, as you know from previous discussions, uh, Jay, uh, my primary business is energy efficiency. And we're always looking for methodologies, and we are always trying to persuade our, our clients to adopt methodologies that are predictive in nature. And uh, when you can, the better you can predict what's going to happen in uh, an energy using system, the better you can conserve the energy in that system um, because you can, you're able to respond faster to changing conditions. And a lot of waste is in in the changing conditions. So efficient equipment still wastes energy during those transitions, and that's really the opportunity here with the grid. Once we understand what we can do to avoid those those transient conditions uh, and uh, make the whole system uh, pretty well see ahead of itself, see ten feet ahead instead of an inch ahead, or as we are now a foot behind. Uh, that's uh, that's going to change uh, change how we how we do things, and I think it's uh, you know it's proven successful in some of the mainland experimental efforts. It should it should prove successful here. And who knows? Maybe we'll be able to invent something, um, you know, build some technology that we can actually export to the rest of the world, who is out there waiting to see what Hawaii will do. George, I, I um, I'm looking forward with you in excitement to the installation of this battery next summer. I hope that you and I can talk, if not sooner, then at least at that time to uh, check and see what happens and and how it proceeds. I, uh, I thanks very much for appearing on our show again. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. I look forward to our next time together. Absolutely, my pleasure, Jay. Thank you too. That's George Bender, Molokai resident, joining us by Skype today. He's the leader of the Chelsea Group, which is an energy, energy consulting firm uh, in Molokai. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We'll, we're followed today by Senator Josh Green, who's going to talk about uh, Im impaired driving with Archie Kale and Carol McNamee of MAD. Then we'll have uh, our chief scientist, Mike DeWert, in the Think Tech Talks about pushing the envelope for science in Hawaii. And finally, Asia in Review, uh, China's river and air runs black. 
with Professor James Cook of UH Manoa. Anyway, uh, thank you again, George. We'll be back with our next show in just a minute. Aloha.